Well, welcome to this week's Back Chat from the Pitt Sports Bar in Leeds. And a very special Back Chat we have as well. It's a bit like a rugby league Christmas carol. Playing the part of Scrooge is Martin Sadler from League Publications. Uh, the ghost of rugby league past, Maurice Lindsay. And the ghost of rugby league future is, of course, Robert Elston. It's lovely to have you all along. It's a very different Back Chat as well this week. Not so much the controversy, a bit more nostalgia. Maurice, it's lovely to see you. We don't see en enough of you in rugby league these days. Uh, but just to start with the game as it is at the moment, when, when you look at the game of Rugby League, and in particular Super League, what are your thoughts? Well, in many ways it's advanced dramatically. The, the, the athletes themselves are getting better and better. The game's getting faster and faster. But I privately worry because I think it needs refreshing. It needs an uplift. And hopefully the man sitting next to me will deliver that. Well, I was going to say, you're, you're the man to deliver that then. What, what's the uplift? What, 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 how does it get refreshed, Robert? I think the, the game always has had many, many positives, many great attributes. Its values, its athletes, its fans, its clubs. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, product. But listen, the reality is I don't think I'd be sitting here today if it didn't have problems and it wasn't in need of... Um, a shot in the arm, a lift, a big uplift, I think. So, you know, I'm really excited and passionate about that. We've got lots to work with, as I said, those things I listed off before. So I, I, I really feel we have to uh, have a real close look at what the game stands for, what it's all about, tell a much more younger, ambitious, dynamic story and drive it forward. And that's really my intention, uh, my challenge, my opportunity. So I'm really looking forward to doing that. There's a lot to work with. Uh, but it needs a lot of work uh, on it, I think. But the thing is, um, Rob, that Morris summed it up really well just now because, you know, the athletes are stronger, better, faster. You know, the game is certainly, in my opinion, as exciting as it ever was on, on, on the field. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But yet the game doesn't project itself. You know, that's the real problem, isn't it? We, we, we've, we've lost the art of projecting the game. And actually, if I can just sort of say something about the way Morris handled it when he was in charge. The great thing about Morris, and you know, I'm not just saying this because you're here, but, but, but you were a naturally optimistic you know, person who, who loved nothing more than going into the media and telling everybody what, what a great game rugby league was. And I think we've missed that since you've not been, not, not been doing it. You're, you're very much a glass half full sort of a guy. I think, Morris, your, your great strength was the vision. Sometimes you know, people might have mocked you because you know, your, your vision was almost too grand in, in, in some respects, but at least Morris used to, you know, project a, you know, a future for the game. And, you know, you were the man in charge when, you know, this incredible transformation came about in 95, 96. Um, you know, that some of us have been calling for, I've been calling for summer rugby, you know, I'd been calling for grand finals and all that sort of stuff. And I don't know whether Morris read League <laughs> Express or not, but certainly he delivered those things, which just, have been great things for yeah, the game. Just, just, let's, let's go back, let's get let's to the nostalgia. And going back to, to 1995, 1996, um, there was a move within the game to actually move to summer anyway, wasn't there? There was a meeting, my memory says, that there was a meeting at Headingley at which the game was going to be discussing a move to the summer season. And again, my memory is that Leeds and Workington were the only two clubs against. And that was the meeting when the Murdoch Millions were introduced. But do you think even without the Murdoch Millions, the game would have gone to summer anyway? It would. There was um, a group of four, in fact, who were pushing very hard for it. Gary Hetherington, who wasn't at Leeds he in was the at the old days, indeed. Yeah. Uh, um, a man at Oldham, um, a man at Bradford, Chris Caisley. Yeah. And to be honest, everybody said, well, they would, wouldn't they? Because they were, they were the coldest grounds in yeah, the country. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I said, yeah, but it's not that. Uh, and I told everybody a story <laughs> that Dennis Bett said to me. He said, Maurice said, when we go to Australia on tour, he said, we train in T-shirts or singlets, and you want to train, it's wonderful. And he said, in February in England, you go to a kid's game, he said, there's a, a winger there with his sleeves rolled down because his hands are freezing, he can't catch the ball, he doesn't want to be there, he wants to be home. Uh, how are you going to coach an under 12? And I thought, bloody hell, he's right. Mm. And, you know, the public, I thought about that. Very few women went to the game in those days. It was all men in cloth caps. And the girls, apart from getting their dresses torn in the turnstiles, which was rusty as hell, <laughs> Uh, they, they were freezing. They, why would they go to a, a wintry ground at 
watersheddings. So it needed refreshing in that respect, and I think summer rugby would have come, Dave, yes it would. Mm. Mm. It's interesting that, Morris, because I remember a guy, one of the great adherents of summer rugby was Mike Smith from Keithley Cougars, mm -hmm. you probably remember him. And, you know, they, they, they developed the Cougars idea, you know, while we were still playing in winter. And I remember once talking to him, and uh, he said, well, you know, we've got all these incredible number of kids coming and watching Keithley and really, you know, buying into the Cougars identity. And he says, he, you know, it, then they had a game at Batley in the middle of winter. And all these kids turned up, you know, to this, 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 this game at Batley. And he said, he, he, as he walked around the ground, it was so cold and freezing that all these kids were crying. <laughs> you know? Well, that's it. And you can't you know? coach a kid under those no, circumstances. No, they never come again. But Robert and I share the same philosophy, which is that we're in the entertainment business. And we Absolutely. have to appeal to everybody. If they're going to either watch it on television or come through the turnstiles, they need to be facilitated. And in winter, you couldn't do that. Mm. I mean, at Wigan, you remember Wigan so well, Dave, in the yeah. old days. Yeah. The roof was leaking, the pies were three weeks old. It was <laughs> dreadful. Yeah. The river caves at the back. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. At half time, particularly. Yeah. Um, the game had that. The game had that in 95, 96, that switch to summer, which gave it an automatic push. And it became, you know, nationally a big focus on rugby league. What can ha I mean, does it need a revolution like that, at that scale, to get the focus back on the game? I don't think it does, but it definitely needs a lot more ambition. It needs a lot more confidence. As I said before, I think it needs a youthfulness re-injecting back into it. And you are right, Dave, we talked before about almost a perfect storm in the mid-90s where there was a centenary, there was a World Cup, there was summer, there was... Or Morris's great work with Sky, there was um, Paris, etc. You know, within a very short space of time, I, I was incredibly fortunate that Morris took a chance on me and brought me into RFL at, at a time, you know, unprecedented in rugby league history, and arguably probably what happened again in terms of events all mm. working together, mm. which certainly generated uh, national profile. Listen, we we can't reconstruct that, um, but what we do need to do is speak with a lot more ambition and and confidence you know and I, and, I, and I think you know we are intrinsically linked to uh, the fortunes of the north of England and you know 30 40 years ago the north of England was largely um, uh, d decimated uh, you know and, and 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 a lot of hope and a lot of ambition and a lot of uh, pride was taken out of the north of England uh, when I walk around the north of England when I drive around the north of England now that's all changed you know young people are creative or entrepreneurial or ambitious and that really is the future vision for our game. It has to be, and we have to align ourselves to that, and we have to be proud, ambitious, and young, and, and, and tell the world that story. The, sure. other, the other aspect of, of 95, 96, the whole, the whole move to summer, was that the broadcaster, Sky, B Sky B, I think it was at the time, but Sky really bought into rugby league, didn't they? It became part of Sky. It was almost inseparable, Sky, rugby league. They were, they were part of the same thing. Can you remember, I know you went for, for dinner with Rupert Murdoch, but can you remember the first inkling you got that this 87 million quid or however much it was was on its way? Um, no, the original um, Thunderbolt came when I was told to go and meet a man called Sam Chisholm, who recently died, yeah. um, who was a chief exec of Sky, who wasn't a rugby league man, he was a Kiwi, if anything you liked, rugby union, but he was under instructions from News Corporation to do this deal. And uh, we were on something like £300,000 a year then from the BBC. Mm. I think it was £990,000 for a three-year deal. So we never had any money. And um, when I sat in front of Sam Chisholm, he said, uh, listen, mate, he said, I'm going to go straight cut to the chase. He said, uh, I'll offer you uh, £15 million. So I thought, bloody hell, 15 million, that's a fortune. And I was stumbling to get my words out to say <laughs> yes. And he said, so times five years, that's 75 million. <laughs> well, I, I, when they picked me up off the floor, I, I said, I, I'll, I'll have to go back to the, to the clubs to talk about it, sort of pretending to be brave, which I wasn't. So that was the first inkling. And then because of little um, changes that we had, it went to 87 million, yeah. which was a tremendous coup. But you know, it wasn't just that, Dave. Uh, Sky are undoubtedly world leaders in sports production mm. and when they explained to me that they'd studied what the BBC were doing and I know that 
your great friends of yours, and I. Yeah. Well, they pay, they pay my mortgage, so absolutely, be and I'll be very careful <laughs> what I say. But they used to cover a game with four cameras. Yeah. We finished up with forty cameras from Sky. Mm. Well, imagine all the invention that they came up with, mm. and people like Neville Smith, who in his day was a world brilliant genius at producing yeah. sport. He would say still is, if he's watching, he will yeah. be watching. He's well, still he's yeah. nearly <laughs> as old as me, so his, his day is coming uh, to an end. I've talked to him the other day. I, I'm a great admirer, and he brought in the big screen and yeah. many, and we worked together on so many things. But they had an unbridled approach to sport, whereas the BBC, my dear friend who was a head of sport straight from Oxford into the BBC, never really understood the north of England, he just thought that we'd be happy to take what we were given. Mm. Mm. Well, we weren't. Yeah. And when Sky came along and made us a tremendous offer, not just the money, which was very important, but the, the production facilities and the, the vision and the ambition, well, that was music to my ears. That's what I wanted more than the money. Was it, well, was let's it not forget also, Morris, just the sheer number of games they were prepared to televise. Yeah, so you're right, not just the way they were going to do it. Um, but there was never a day when the BBC was showing, you know, wall-to-wall -wall rugby league. That wasn't happening. And the magazine either, you know, program, so Sky were quite prepared yeah. to do boots and all yeah. and everything yeah, yeah. else. Yeah. When when that all came out, um, I mean, it was very exciting to be in the media at that time because we sure. kind of we were at the back end of an age that the game had not changed for 30, yeah. 40 years, and suddenly everything was changing, and mergers were being talked about. Okay, you thought <laughs> on mergers in just a second, but I mean, how, how do you remember those days, Martin? Those days of mergers and that big exciting announcement. The main thing I remember is that our newspaper sales went up rapidly. Yeah, um, you know, because there was such a, there was such a lot to talk about. Oh gosh, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I it was the best ever time we had for sales, but. Um, I mean, the mergers thing, you know, it, it was never really realistic, was it, ultimately, you know, for, for, for clubs to come together in that, in that way. And I, th I think perhaps, you know, everybody underestimated, perhaps including me as well, you know, the, the, the attachment that fans have to their clubs, no matter what, you know, the, 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 the being a fan of a club, it, you know, you, you go through thick and thin with them and um, you don't want to see the club damaged or changed any no, was that, significant way. Was that grandfather, your father, yeah, absolutely. But was that, was that something that the television company, the Sky, was saying, look, this would be great if we had more strategic presence around the country? Or was that something that came from within? No, it, it had to come from within because the original offer um, from News Corporation uh, was uh, effectively a new structure altogether. In Australia, they were stripping their clubs down because they had something like eight clubs in mm. Sydney and they were mm. all going broke. So they had to do a few mergers. And they wanted a 10 team competition, which became a few more. Uh, we were told that the um, 10 clubs, if we, we, we would choose the 10, would get something like one and a half million each, which yeah. would be the 15 million. And of course, people like Eric Ashton, wonderful man, uh, nevertheless, he saw a great opportunity for St Helens, so he wanted to vote for that. Mm. Whereas the other clubs, just outside, uh, Witness and Dewsbury and everybody else, yep. they had a different view. So it needed a lot of arguing. Um, but because the money was only going to go to 10 clubs, uh, the m mergers were actually not a desire. They were a necessity. It had mm. to be talked about. Mm. And I'll never forget, I went straight from Sam Chimson's office in London to Rodney Walker's office. He worked for the Sports Council at the time. And I put the idea to him and we were both gobsmacked at the opportunity that was coming. And uh, Rodney actually, uh, together with me, we wrote down a few theoretical partnerships. Yeah. And we called a meeting that very night, that Thursday night, in Huddersfield, yeah. on, on Ainley in, in, in Top there. And we discussed it, and of course, it was the beginning of the mania, mm. merger mania. Yeah. But it was a terrific piece of history. Yeah, yeah it was. It was. And, and you move on twenty years. Theoretically, is mergers the way for? I mean, I'm saying this theoretically, and I don't want to put you in some kind of political maelstrom here. <laughs> but theoretically, <laughs> I am doing. Uh, theoretically, is is mergers a way for? Because we want to fit a Cumbria uh, in. We want to fit expansion. I think. In. I think the principles that. Um, saw mergers putting on the agenda or table for discussion that were relevant 20, 30 years ago still as relevant today. Yeah. And, and I think you look at um, Australian Rugby League, there are a lot of differences economically. I don't, I, having lived in Australia for 20 years, and uh, sorry, for two years, a long time ago, 20 years ago, 
I'm not quite sure the tribalism is quite as strong as it is in the UK, and that, that's a big thing to say, but I don't sense it's quite as tribalistic. Because we've um, had them, I mean, St. George, Illawarra. But, but my, that's my point, Dave. So that's my point. I think, I think yeah. that what happens in Australia is they seem to be better planned, they seem to be more patient with both expansion and merger. So they, they you know, you know, you, you look at expansion and that has been structured. You know, I heard at the time we were going into Paris, I think Auckland Warriors were on the scene and Auckland yeah. had, you know, considerably more funding. They had a longer run in. We, we, we I think, were less planned. And we, I think the same applies around mergers. Mm -hmm. I think they've made a decision and they were prepared to stick with it. And they've given it time. And inevitably, a merger will take time. It won't take three years, five years. It will take decades for it to embed and, you know, create its own identity. So. I, th I think Australia, I think there's more money behind it, so the economics are more powerful, but I think they're also more patient and I think they're also more planned in that respect. And, and, and you know, maybe there's a big lesson there for the game over here. Don't okay, forget, well, don't, we'll, don't we'll have to leave it there because right. we're right at the end of uh, this first part, but fascinating stuff. And it's flown by, 60 minutes, absolutely flown by, but we've got parts two and three to come up, so don't go anywhere. We'll be back after this break. Welcome back to part two of Back Chat from the Pitt Sports Bar in Leeds. And as we said, a very special guest list with us this week. We've got Maurice Lindsay, former chairman of everything, I think, weren't he? Well, once our vice chairman of Wigan, but chairman of everything else. Robert Elston, whose, uh, whose job it is, is to recreate the magic in Rugby League and Super League. And uh, Martin Sadler, who recreates magic every week in one way or another, <laughs> but we don't like to delve too deep into that. Um, right, second half. Um, we, we talked about the mergers, and, and we were just talking about the mergers before we finished in that first half. So you're saying that there might be an appetite for mergers in the game, <laughs> but only if, I'm, I'm not putting you on a spot here, but if clubs come to you, if, if two clubs came to you, so I'll give you an example. Oldham, Swinton, Rochdale came to you and said, we'd like to merge and become a Manchester. Absolutely. Yeah? I think that's um, something we should uh, really explore and promote. I think. Why, why not? You know, listen. I was at um, the Etihad campus. There's a stadium there in the middle of the in, in, in the middle of the Etihad, which would make a perfect home for for a Manchester Rugby League club. And you know, it was uh, running through my mind as I'm sat there talking to them and looking out at that place. So, you know, absolutely. I think I think probably more so expansion, really, Dave, than uh, the the merger. And I think it's that proactive strategic expansion that we should consider but the reality is that has to be uh, properly planned properly funded and with a degree of patience and as a sport uh, not unlike many other sports patience and adequate funding isn't always um, isn't there in top priority one of my challenges to do that that you would see a, a location that has got some potential uh, where, where the game can prosper in the longer term. Can we sustain it, grow it, nurture it? Well, you're going to need a plan, you're going to need some money, you're going to need some patience. And can I create that? Can I find the funding from in, a, in the existing game? Can I get that patience? Can we put that plan in place? Can we find the individuals are there in the long term? History tells you that's, uh, that's quite a challenge. But, uh, but you know, I, uh, again, I, th I think a lot of our expansion has been um, not necessarily ad hoc, but we're, uh, we, we do it almost with one arm tied behind our back. Mm. We, you know, Paris had one arm tied behind its back, of course it did. You know, it wasn't uh, proactively promoted. There wasn't positive discrimination against Paris. And in fact, in many ways, I think there was, you know, if you can do it, uh, great, but get on with it, stand alone and make it happen. And in three years time, if you're good, then terrific. You know, I think we have to be more proactive. I'm not saying that's, easy to do I'm not sensing there's a huge appetite to get on with that but I think that's one of my challenges to look and see if we can achieve that yeah. but surely surely the, the the best approach is to actually get rugby league's profile higher to start with yeah. because you know if the profile isn't high 
then with the best will in the world, you're not going to get people wanting to come into the game, no, probably wanting not. to create new clubs I, I think, I think in places like Manchester. I think there's truth in that, Martin. However, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. I think you know, no. I was chatting to uh, somebody before about this, where we can focus very much on our heartland, get the heartland right, get our game prospering and growing, uh, you know, in the north of England. Uh, and once we've got that, look to expand. Well, I don't think we have that luxury. I think we have to consider everything in its own merit. Certainly, we have to get on with the job in hand and make mm. sure all our clubs in the north of England are, are playing, performing, operating to high standards. That doesn't mean you shouldn't you know, rule out expansion in parallel with that. Well, I think it would help. Martin, yeah. Raising the profile uh, isn't just the job of the administration. No, no, no. Uh, people who pay money to watch the game don't pay to watch administrators no, they no, pay absolutely. to watch the players mm. now the players throughout the history of the game have raised the profile of the sport in the 1950s and 60s it was Billy Boston mm. then you come right through and you come through Ellery Hanley mm. Jason Robinson Martin of Fire many other players mm. Gary mm. Schofield they with their personality and their athletic ability they raise the game and you've got to focus on them. Yeah, we've, got to, we've got to allow them to express themselves more. Is Indeed. It, is Na what you're saying. 96, uh, you have Paris and you, you put him in charge. Uh, now we've got Toronto. Do you see parallels between Paris and Toronto? And, and how, how would you, if you were chief executive of the RFL or Super League at the moment, how would you view Toronto at this stage? With some hesitation, uh, let's not forget that Paris was only... 50 minutes away we had planes going from Leeds Bradford Airport they were there in no time mm. uh, the time difference was negligible um, the tradition for rugby albeit rugby union at the time in in the north of France uh, uh, rugby union had the head start on us we nevertheless had people who understood and enjoyed the rugby ball yeah. um, so I don't think it's a fair analogy to link uh, Paris to Toronto extreme bravery on the people who want to go with Toronto but um, I've, I've got certain reservations at this stage. Mm. Mm. Why did Paris not work then as well as it might? I mean we, we remember that wonderful heady night that first night I think it was Sheffield, Sheffield. wasn't it and uh, Paris won. At 17 you You'd have put great. your money on it working then yeah. wouldn't you? Great, yeah great quote from you when everyone was worried because there weren't a lot of people in at the start but they came in and you said well we all know what the periphery is like on a Friday night it's yeah. difficult to move again <laughs> and we do it um, but why, why, why then I mean how would you have done Paris differently how should Paris have been done differently? Well what never came out was that we had to play in Paris because politically in France if you want the government and its governing body uh, to be funded you had to have your head office in Paris a French law nothing to do with us we couldn't influence it we wanted to play down in the south of France because that's where all the rugby league was played uh, Toulouse was a rugby league area there, there were many opportunities down south. Because the original plan was to have two teams in France wasn't it the original plan indeed on that 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 day when it was all announced Grand National Saturday and indeed. we were all at Central Park and it was Paris and a southern French team so Indeed. why wasn't there another French team? Uh, there wasn't it? enough money generically in France to promote more than one team in fact we with the News Corporation money had to f completely fund the Paris operation Robert worked with a shoestring budget and just did everything almost single-handedly the truth is that we didn't really want to be in Paris we threw everything at the opening game and it worked mm. but it was never going to bed in permanently. We, we're always going to go down south. The thing that was quite remarkable though, Maurice, was that you actually did get the Paris Saint-Germain name attached to the club. And Paris Saint-Germain We had to pay for it, by the way. Yeah, did well, but right. that's interesting. I didn't, I'd, I'd, I'd never heard that. Not, not a lot well, of money, but there was a license fee. The fact is that Paris Saint-Germain were the biggest name in French sport, yeah. weren't they? I can so remember the Paris Saint-Germain name was owned by a company called Canal Plu, mm. which is still a very big television operator throughout France. Mm. Uh, and granting us that name gave us a terrific start. Exactly, yes. Gave us the, gave us, you're just talking about yeah. an identity. Yeah. But the, re the, reason, the reason, the fundamental reason it didn't work was the club had to exist on one single revenue stream mm. and as Morris said that was the news corporation the sky money and you know for a club starting at zero base to start and generate a crowd of paying attendance a sponsorship uh, family um, hospitality you know you would have needed three five years to get to anything mm. like viable solid revenue streams to go mm. alongside TV so we were living on one revenue stream we also had a lot of other you know uh, yeah. We had clubs the in this country pulling it down. We right? had yeah. clubs pulling yeah, it down. Indeed. We also had an opportunity whereby there were several Australian players off contract. 
and Paris got last bite of that list of players. And mm. I show, I, and again, I'm using that as an illustration to say that if we wanted to proactively support Paris, we could have given them double the TV money for the first three years, and we could have let them have first bite at the Australian sure. players who were off contract. Yeah. But, but the game wasn't brave enough, bold enough, visionary enough to do that. Now, it was actually, actually selfish. Yeah. I think, yeah. as Morris said, you probably wouldn't have ended up in Paris anyway. Therefore, yeah. maybe the game, in a but very enlightened way, saw the writing on the wall. But not, I don't think that's been similar, charitable. Have we not got a similar situation now with Toronto, where you get the feeling from a lot of clubs that they don't want them in Super League? The, you get the, the feeling the, from the, the RFL that they don't really want them in Super League? The difference Might we be is looking back 20 years and going, there's a mistake. No, I think, the I difference think there is, is a though, difference. that they've got David Argyle, who's a billionaire, yeah. who can fund Toronto till the cows come home. But it, if it, Super League said we don't want them in... Well, we don't well, know, do we? But we'll, it's got to we'll be generic. Find. Yes. You, you've got to build up. And yeah. Parisians have got lots of choice. Yeah. They don't have to go out to the exports of Paris to watch a rugby league game. Yeah. When you've got clubs like Hull, and Leeds and Wigan and so on. You've got a generic foundation and that's so important, you build that, on that. And that, yeah. that is the fundamental difference. I think that you have strategic proactive expansion which is around where people play and watch the sport and that's where you make the investment in my opinion. Mm. The game isn't good at freeing up cash to make that investment, whether we'll ever no. be able to do that and give them double the money, but you'd only do that in a place where there are grassroots, where people watch and people play. In yeah. Toronto they don't do that and I think that's why it's different and I think that's why Toronto has to stand on its own two feet and prove that it is then there for the right reasons, that those foundations can come in time. But I think to go to the game now and say fund it, in that, in that, you know, ultimately spurious location, I think it is a bridge too far. If we're not prepared to fund it in Southwest France, yeah. the second team, why would we do it in somewhere as, as mm. random as Canada? Okay, closer to home then, in terms of expansion and in terms of building on what's already been planted. We look at clubs like Coventry at Newcastle, who've done a lot for themselves, have grown the sport, have got players who are playing who are locally locally based players who wouldn't have been playing rugby league had they had those clubs not been existed how, how do you view that I mean how do you view them I mean if you'd have had that opportunity 20 years ago would you have given them more encouragement your commentaries your Newcastles to a certain extent West Wales I know they're getting battered every week but it's, it's still a local enterprise there's, there's, there's some attraction there for sure um, but it needs a long-term plan, as Robert has already identified. We weren't prepared to do that in the early days. We had a lot of clubs who were saying, why not me? Why don't I get the money? Well, they only had a, a basic <laughs> core of three, 4,000 people, and some of them haven't got much more now. Mm. And you've got to look at the area, by all means look at the tradition, uh, but assess how can you develop mm -hmm. it. Now, we tried at Gateshead which was probably wrong because it's not really Newcastle. No. Um, Coventry... Wasn't far off, though. Gateshead was... No, you know, no. Yeah. History tells us might... There's an enmity between the two cities. Yeah, but uh, no, in terms of get, actually getting there, Gateshead, another oh, I take that two, point, three years yes. might have actually got there. Yeah, it ran out of money, as yeah. we know, and had to be Merged with partnered, yeah, yeah, which was sort of a shame, really, but the people who own the club had to make that decision. They, they didn't have enough money to keep going with it because it was at the time... Uh, Kath Hedrington yeah. was, was funding it. Shane Richardson. Indeed, Shane came over, tremendous, tremendous individual with lots mm. of enthusiasm and ideas. But if you want to turn this on its head, I still think there's a lot of juice left in city areas here that we haven't yet mm. really Crosses. developed. Mm. I mean, Hull could be the world leaders in yeah. rugby league. It's a mm. massive city, mm. lots of money, sporting council that sort of run their affairs in the city, a beautiful stadium. Um, we need to look at one or two areas close to home and say, are we doing the right thing in that area? I think the answer is no. Do we want to do the right thing in this area? The answer is yes. And I think we need to strengthen our core and spread from a position of strength. Mm. At the moment, I think we're spreading from a position of weakness. Yeah, because Manchester, Manchester, Manchester did you, did you the support the idea of licensing, for example, you know, when that came in? Well, franchises we were calling them, weren't we? Franchi yeah. uh, yes, I do. If you remember, well, I know you do, and Robert was part of it. We wrote Framing the Future mm. in the early 90s, uh, before we got the money from News Corporation. That document still is the blueprint that we should be almost working religiously to. Mm. Uh, development of the youth, uh, development of the facilities. God heavens, I've seen some of the grounds that we play out now on television and I could weep. Mm. It's I mean, some have improved dramatically, haven't they? But God yeah. bless them, yeah, but yeah. some haven't. Mm. It's easier said than done, though, that, isn't it? I mean, Why? club close to, well, Castleford, club close to your heart, Castleford, Wakefield. 
you know, both would desperately desire to be in better facilities, but for whatever reason, are not able to get them. So oh, Tellings have done it. Warrington have done it. Yeah. So is that down to the clubs? Should of course it is. Yeah. The, yeah. The, 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 it, Saint Helens had the, Saint Helens had a good relationship with the local council. Yeah. So Wakefield's, did Warrington. Wakefield's position is slightly different because there are three clubs in Wakefield. If the council helps one, mm, the, the they keep the running up against it, that. Yes. No. The clubs have to find a way. I mean, Saint Helens weren't a very rich club, uh, and they've done magnificently both on and off the field. Yeah. Warrington. Um, played as you know at uh, Wilderspool which was tumbling mm -hmm. and uh, and now look where they are everybody wants to play there no I, I think the clubs have to take responsibility the governing body whether it's Super League or the Rover Football League don't have billions in the bank to spend that's a myth yeah uh, all the money goes to the clubs all the money that News Corporation gave us every penny went to the clubs the the central body never kept a penny yeah so we can't say like the NFL can in America right we'll put half a billion into that and make it work we we must find a way to improve the facilities just just a couple of minutes left so i want to touch on this if, if it's not mergers what about the ground shares i mean wakefield and castle it's crying out for a ground share isn't it i i, I and featherston as well why not dave but i but i come back to exactly what morris has just said that's down to the clubs that's absolutely down yeah. to the clubs if that's the solution to the stadium having spent 13 years at everton knowing that we're in a stadium that was 125 years old we absolutely need to, needed to find a new stadium. That was going to cost us fortune, hundreds of millions of pounds. We looked enviously at all around the Premier League where there were different sets of circumstances. Arsenal playing on land at Highbury that was worth a fortune. You have Sunderland taking advantage of grant and funding around that situation. Bolton and Wigan, whoever, taking advantage of retail development. And in Everton, we just needed to unlock that missing ingredient. But very few big stadiums were being built without a substantial third party leg up if you like from yeah. council or from retail so it isn't that easy and Warrington and Saints have done a brilliant job taking advantage of that Leeds at Headingley you know constantly uh, reinvesting in Headingley mm. which you know is going to be an amazing facility mm. um, but it's not up to Super League and it's not up to Rugby League I don't think but to do, do that but to but to welcome it if the answer if, yeah. if Wakefield, Featherstone and Castleford can get together and build that stadium would we support that sharing absolutely yeah. because the facility is a massive part just of, just no of work, the just because we don't know how to time it but do you actually lose patience with clubs as, a, as an organization um, is there a point where you think you well, have to do yeah, yeah. you have so to so you do, bring yeah. someone else you in have to do as a, I mean I, I, I'm not close to the Castleford stadium situation but it has been on the agenda for years and years and mm. years and it's always just around the corner and yet you know Weldon Road Menderhose Jungle you know deteriorates year on year it does not represent what Super League is all about and you have to run out of patience you cannot live on promises and you know you know that's down to me to make sure uh, we, we do that I'm prepared to do that and you cannot live on history yeah. well another 60 minutes has absolutely flown by uh, we've still got one part to go don't go anywhere again we're back with a third part of Bat Chat in just a few moments time So welcome back to the third and sadly final part of uh, Back Chat this week from the Pitt Sports Bar in Leeds. If you've uh, only just switched on, then catch us on YouTube, the previous two parts. You won't want to miss those because we've got a lovely panel today. Maurice Lindsay, who's the former vice chairman and chairman of Wigan. We've, uh, we've now found out because we're going to talk about Wigan a bit more in this part. Robert Elston, who's of course the new chief executive of Super League. And uh, also with us, Martin Sadler, who's from League Express newspaper. I am. You are. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maurice, um, I mean, you, you, you became famous, some would say infamous, in rugby league because of what you did at Wigan. And we won't go through the whole story because we, we've heard it so many times. But this is the 30th year of the start of Wigan's great cup run, 1988, and then they won it eight years on the bounce. What are your memories of those particular days? Whew, uh, 
still with me, yeah. uh, and I'm sure still with a lot of uh, Wigan fans. The, um, the vibrancy of Wembley, the old Wembley, which was always packed with 99,000 people, no matter who was playing there, and the build-up, the excitement, the trains, the buses that were going down the railway lines and the motorway, all of that is so vivid in my memory. But the first game, well, we won the Cup in 85, but we then went to 88 for the start of the run. We played Halifax, and um, they had a great tub thumper chairman that put a lot of money in and was making them quite a, quite a famous outfit. And the rival was fantastic. They were the league champions. We really had a, a sensational match. But the point I made earlier in the show about individuals being the backbone of the game, you know, we had so many stars that were really, really glittering stars in our game. Mm. I didn't have to open my mouth. They promoted the game for us. They mm. were wonderful. But the, the joke going around Wigan um, until we won it in 85 was that uh, since Wigan last won the Challenge Cup, they'd built some damn motorway all the way down to London. I had to live with all of that for years. Uh, and then, of course, the beginning, no one knew it was going to be the beginning of such a glorious run, but wonderful memories, of, but especially for the fans. Yeah, yeah. Do you think you spoiled the Wigan fans, though, Morris? Because, you know, eight years in a row, you know, the Wigan fans ultimately thought they were going to win it every year to kingdom come, didn't they, they, I suppose? I think, Martin, we also spoiled it for the game. Mm. Uh, Jeff Hurst, a friend of mine who was a school teacher in the Wigan area, said, do you worry sometimes, Morris, that we're strangling the game? I said, yes, I do. Um, yeah, nobody could keep up with you. Basically. Well, I remember sitting in the Royal Box and uh, we were playing Witness one year and uh, Witness scored first, I think. Uh, anyway, they scored first. And everybody in the row box jumped up, except me. And then when we scored, I jumped up, and there was only me jumped <laughs> up. And I thought, something wrong here. And then Jeff Hurst again said to me, a very bright man, he said, why, did you realise that we might be killing the game? I said, why? He said, well, think of a, a six-year-old kid introduced by his dad to rugby league. For nine years, almost, he's only ever seen Wigan lift the cup. Mm. His team have never lifted the cup. And that's when I went to headquarters mm. to actually try and change it. Yeah. We, we talk about there's, there's this big thing in the game now that there's no superstars of rugby league and people say, we've, we've talked about this before, Robert, Robert Elston, Chief Executive of Super League, um, that people say, well, where are the Ellery Hanleys, the Joe Lydons, the Andy Gregorys, the Sean Edwards? The people they name are not rugby league stars, they're the Wigan stars yeah. of that eight-year run. Yeah. Winning the Challenge Cup on the BBC for eight years that's what lifted Rugby yeah. League's profile, Wigan's profile, but Rugby League's profile. Yeah, so. absolutely right, Dave. And uh, and a lot of credit, all the credit goes to Morris for doing that. You know, for having the vision to create a full-time professional Rugby League team, and then going out and getting the best Rugby League players on the planet, uh, created a dynasty that will live with Rugby League fans forever. You know, so so all the credit to him for that. That's I think one of the consequences of of a salary cap, where you know a salary cap means that at the start of every season, twelve teams have got large number of the teams have got a bite at, uh, at winning something and I think on balance that's the right thing for the game but you know uh, certainly Morris wasn't playing to any salary cap rules he was playing to what Wigan could afford and hmm. uh, and clearly that self-fulfilling that you know we win the cup we reinvest we win the cup we reinvest was was a model that worked and it put rugby league on the agenda it put uh, it put Wigan and it put his players on the agenda and we certainly have to do that. Absolutely one of the big priorities for the game for going forward is to do that. Now we have more opportunity through all the multitude of new channels and social media channels. You know, the world is ready and able to listen to what we have to off offer from a, from a player point of view. But ultimately that world is also very cluttered mm. and everybody else is trying to find the same space. But we've got some amazing uh, athletes, amazingly talented rugby league players, amazing personalities some really good guys, some really funny guys, some guys you'd love to spend a day with. We've got to bring those personalities to the fore. Football, you know, um, football has exactly the same characters, but struggles just sheer, just sheer scale of it. And it's one big advantage that rugby league has, 
you know, that our players are more personable, are more approachable, and we've got to take advantage of But can of I just that. say something then to, to that, Rob, because I, I agree with everything you've said, but the problem is that there's a trend now among clubs to try and ring-fence their players, to actually prevent them well, we've from got talking to, to the media. Yeah, and Martin, that's got a, I mean, when Morris had that fantastic team, you know, at, at, at Wigan, well, that's all the players were accessible. That's all, you know, you could, you all by one. Well, all by one, perhaps, yeah. yes. But, more, more than that, you know. Yeah, but he, he expressed himself just by going on the yeah, field. Yeah, 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 yeah. The fact that he was also one of the most handsome men in the country didn't do any harm either. We're talking about Ellery Hamley here. Oh, yeah. are we really? Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you, you thought Sean had to Ma Martin's <laughs> point. Um, I think you're right. I think mm. the clubs innocently suppress the personalities of their players. They do. I they're terrified of them speaking to the media, actually, just in case they say something out of turn. The colour supplements for the uh, Sunday papers in the old days used to do features on our players. Um, they always wanted to do Ellery, and he didn't make himself available, but he, he promoted the game in different ways. But other players, Martin Fire became one, Jason Robinson, that, but all of them had something to offer. Sure. And the public wanted to look at them and read about them. I know that Robert shares this uh, opinion, and I, you watch Robert go. He'll make the players be more presentable. I think a lot of it comes from Australia. They almost want their players, Australian coaches in this country, to be modest mm. and ca quiet and just whisper. Don't de denigrate the opposition. Never say anything be, exciting. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, and you that's guys. A crazy thing. I know they're afraid of the Sundays turning them over. Yeah. Well, that's part of life, I'm afraid. Yeah. Yeah. Could you do it again? I mean, if you if you know worth the chairman of Wigan, could you build that dynasty under the rules that apply these days? Probably not. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a myth that there were all overseas players that built Wigan. No, they weren't. They were all Wigan boys. Well, a lot of them were Wigan. Yeah. Most mm, of yeah. them. In fact, when we beat Manly, there were 13 English players in there, yeah. you know, people like Sean Wayne and yeah. others. So I think it could be done, but it, it's not as easy. I think the schools in Wigan were desperate to produce more star players and they did their utmost with their coaching standards. I brought them all in, they were part of the club mm. and they knew what we were all trying to achieve. I know Robert will do that uh, because he wants the players to be the stars. Yeah. Yeah, the problem now is that a lot of Wigan schools are providing players for the other code, for Rugby Union. I mean, you look at uh, England Rugby Union, mm. and that, that kind of automatic it's a threat. that you're going to go and play for Wigan isn't, doesn't exist anymore. That's a problem, again, has throughout the North, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, um, we are living in a, a different world. You know, at the time Morris was building that amazing Wigan team, they were probably the only professional rugby club of either code in the country and any of you know the best players who wanted to earn a good living playing rugby you know Wigan was absolutely on their shopping list so that you know that that's changed you know in that 30-year period football has absolutely become yeah omnipresent football is everywhere it's transcending uh, male female demographic groups ethnic groups football is everywhere mm. you know mm. in, in Wigan you know in, in every town in the country. People are running around in Messi and Ronaldo shirts with footballs. We've absolutely got to try and reverse that. The way to reverse it, and it is a little bit chicken and egg, is to do exactly what Morris has described or what he did do in the late 80s, early 90s and create those superstars. Well, you'll we, do that. We, I know you will. I mean, if you look at people like David Beckham and Ronaldo, and other, they built football around the world mm. because of just what they're capable mm. of doing and, mm. what, and who they are. Mm. Um, Beckham did more for English football than any administrator I can think of. Yes, 100% right. Exactly. 100% right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do we do we sometimes get obsessed by the product in rugby league? We talk <laughs> about it being the greatest game, don't we? Do I we, hate that. And, and do you, why do you hate that? Term? Well, it's denigration of every other sport. Mm. I had this argument uh, in London. I went to a lunch uh, with the Sky Boys, and I said I used to hate it when Eddie and Steve said, "Look at that, the greatest game of mm. all." Well, who are you talking to? Because yeah. if I'm a, a cricket follower and you say that, I'll switch off. Yeah. It, yeah. It, you can't say that. Mm. There's nothing wrong with other great sports. They've all come up the, the ladder anyway, and we've probably gone down a bit. Mm. Uh, we know it's a great sport. That's why we play it and watch it. But it's not the only game in town, and we have no. to fight. And I know Robert's a realist, and he'll fight. And, and, and I think, you know, come back to what one of the things Martin said right at the top of the show, and Morris had talked about the greatness of our athletes and the greatness of our game. I, I think we have to uh, challenge that. You know, I think one of the things I've always wanted to do in sport is, you know, sport is full of myths and, and, and beliefs that that's true, that's true, that's true. And now every place I've worked, all my staff, step back from it and challenge it. Is that true? And is this product better than it's ever been? 
I, I think we absolutely have to challenge that. I see some very really? one-dimensional rugby league. Mm. I see, you know, sixes and sevens potentially being coached out of the game. Mm. I don't see a loose forward who can put a man through a gap anymore. Now, you've got to also temper that with that is, you know, is about my nostalgia of when summers were longer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Maybe it is a bit of nostalgia, but I think we have to inspect the game and see whether it is as quick, whether we are getting as much, you know, as many plays in, 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 in an 80 minute period, whether the 80 minutes are becoming 90 minutes. Let's actually go and stop doing it anecdotally. Let's do it factually and see yeah. whether the game is quicker than ever. The fact is, though, that, you know, whatever, however good the game is or however bad perhaps it sometimes is, you know, I don't think that's what counts. No. W watching sport is a cultural thing. Yeah. And, well, you look and at, you the, look the key Twitter. thing is to get the, get it back into the culture, particularly, as you say, in the north of England, where its strength mm. lies. You go not to just Twickenham. in the north You go to Twickenham and, and, and for an England game, an England mm. international, and the crowd is not interested in the game. You know, the game kicks off and they're to and froing. But, but it's I, the I, occasion I, I, rather than the... No, the and, and I, but, I, but I think if we're into the business of competing on occasions, we're not going to win that battle. No. right. We, we can make our occasion better. We have to win based on what happens on that pitch with our amazing players playing this game Every that, week. That, that, that can, you know, if it's played well, can be the best game th yeah. that there is. I, you know, my, my two kids, you know, growing up in South Manchester, I have three kids actually, two of them were interested in rugby league, you know, have, have, you know came to cast last year and my daughter just absolutely riveted as anybody would be. This year she sat with me watching games and at half time, you know, it really is, phones out, you know. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> You know, there's been too many knock-ons, there's been too many errors, the ref's blowing up too. And, and, and that is what matters. That is what's getting my 22-year-old daughter hooked on this game, is a game that moves quick, that she can understand, that's got some entertainment, that's just trying... The, that's what I must admit, the, the thing that drives me mad mo more than anything else is pedantic little knock-ons that m make the game stop. You know, just a, a, the bubble of the ball that they play the ball or whatever it might I be. I think it's more than that though, Martin. Yeah, if you is. watch the NRL, which I know you do, all, all of yeah, us do, yeah. they don't knock on. No, no, no. They, they technically perfect their game and if they do knock Absolutely on right. once every 10 Absolutely games, oh right. God, he, he goes into a, yeah. a, right. and a that, meltdown. And that's the technical level we've got to aspire to through youth development, through great coaching, through development pathways. If we can get that technical bar higher and higher and higher, we will undoubtedly get a product that moves quicker, that is more entertaining. Now that's not to say you know, it's a million miles yeah, but off. I think the NRL have their own critical. problems actually, Rob. You know, uh, the, the, the NRL is too structured in, no, for, for, for many people. No, for many not, people. No, it I is. think it's flowing football. Well, I, I, it's very, very I, high school. So it, it is in many cases, but in some cases it's just, not. Just actually. going back to where we started this part of the programme, um, the, the, the Wigan run, do you have a favourite of those finals? Well, I'm, I'm guessing 89. Well, funnily enough, it was just before the run. It was 85. 85, when yeah. We, when we won yeah. it back, if you want to call it 28, that. Because, 24. of course, Brett Kenny was there. Yeah. Sterling was on the other side. We had... Um, John Ferguson. That has to be everybody's favourite, yeah. doesn't it? That Brilliant. final. I mean, if you look at that, there were 10 tries in the game, Wigan and Hull. Yeah. Five on each side. The result was in the balance to the last minute. Not one try was scored by a forward. Mm. Every try in that game was Every scored. Every try was by. spectacular, wasn't it? And Just it was scored about. by a back. Yeah. Kenny, everybody, they were Gary Schofield, they were all tremendous players. And why do we remember them? Because they were the stars and the personalities of the game. Yeah. That's what I know Robert wants to recreate. And he will do. He needs support, which we haven't touched on today. The clubs have to make sacrifices for the good of the game in the long run. The Rugby Football League have to make big sacrifices, they have to take a step back. They've got to let Super League run because Super League is our star. Let yeah. Super League run. So we need a dynamic movement and I think we've got just the right man here. We've got a minute and 40 seconds left so it's unfair to me to plant this question to you at this stage. <laughs> but the Challenge Cup has lost its lustre, a lot of people would say. The BBC desperately want to move it back to May, June. Is that on the agenda for the Super League clubs, a, a revamping of the Challenge Cup? I, I've been around all 12 Super League clubs in my first six or seven weeks and every single one of them wanted to uh, revamp Challenge Cup. Uh, Top of the list was uh, a new date and, 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 and the old date. Um, and that's something the clubs will put to RFL. Uh, the reasons, uh, the feasibility of that, I don't know, Dave, but it has to be moved um, because undoubtedly it is a big part of Rugby League's calendar. Uh, yeah. And at the moment it's being lost. Yeah. Revamp? Would you, would you welcome that? I wouldn't move the date. I think we've moved the date once already from May to late August. And, and let's, ago, and let's, ago, make, let's just make, make something that we do successful. You know, we, we, we moved it without really planning on, on how it was going to be how it was going to succeed with that move. I think to move it back 
just looks like an admission of failure. Yeah. I don't um, think that's wise in any business. It can't compete with the Super League Grand Final. And that's, well, the, that's the trouble. At the, end you know, of, the end of August, Super League Grand Final. But it, don't, don't forget point, in the old days, The point, though, Martin, if you allow me, yeah. it can't be played at the end of the season. That's the point. Mm. And the Challenge Cup was always played at the end of the season. It was, yes. Mm. And you led to it. Yeah, yeah. You can't know because it mm. doesn't hold a candle to mm. the Super League Grand Final mm. at Old Trafford. That's an interesting point. There were some heady nights in May that you may maybe not getting in August <laughs> at the moment as yeah. well. That's as far as we go, sadly, for this week's back chat because it really has been a, a pleasure with these three and we'll probably be hanging around for another two hours to chat about the stuff we've not chatted about. But thanks very much to Martin Sadler, to Rob Elston, but especially to Maurice Lindsay. Lovely, lovely to see you back again and we'll see you with another back chat in a week's time.